Good morning, everyone. This is Representative Carolyn Partridge coming to you from my home in Wyndham. And this is February 4th, 2021 in the morning. And we are having a, a joint hearing with the House Natural Resources Fish and Wildlife Committee. And today we are going to uh, take up the topic of glyphosate, which is something uh, every couple of years or so we have a a presentation on this so that we can be informed. And uh, I will say that a couple of my committee members, unfortunately, cannot be here today. <laughs> and they are the new people, but um, they will be listening to the, the uh, recording later. So I think what makes a lot of sense, because some folks are new, is that um, we introduce ourselves. And so I will Maybe I'll go and then Amy, do you want to call on your people after we've gotten through this? Yeah? Okay. Um, so Rodney, why don't you go ahead? I'm Rodney Graham represent the Orange One District, which is Williamstown, Washington, Orange, Grant's Berkshire, and Chelsea. Thank you, Tom. I'm Tom Bach. I represent the towns of Chester, Andover, Baltimore, and North Springfield. Thanks, Tom. Terry? Uh, Terry Norris, I represent Benson, Orwell, Shoreham, and Whiting, the Addison Rutland District. All right, Terry. Uh, John, why don't you go ahead? I'm John O'Brien. I represent Royalton and my hometown of Tunbridge. All righty, Vicki. Good morning. I'm Representative Vicki Strahl, and I live in Albany and represent seven towns in Orleans, Caledonia One. Our new members are Heather Supranant, and she is from Barnard, and I'm not going to remember all of her towns. And Henry Pearl, who is, we can say we have a dairy farmer back in the state house, uh, represents the towns of Cabot, Danville, and Peacham. I'm Carolyn Partridge. I represent the towns of Athens, Brookline, um, Grafton, a slice of North of Northwest Minster, all of Rockingham, and my hometown of Wyndham. And Amy, why don't you go ahead? Good morning. I'm Amy Sheldon. I chair the House Natural Resources Fish and Wildlife Committee, and I represent the town of Middlebury. And I'm a little bit of a disadvantage, but I will call on my members in alphabetical order. So Seth Bongards. I don't see Seth. That's not here. So my disadvantage is I can't see everyone right now on my screen. Um, OK, well, Seth is from Manchester, and he's a new member on our committee and uh, Representative Brownell. I represent Pownell and Wolford, living in Pownell. Uh, and uh, that's uh, who I am. Uh, Representative Dolan. Good morning, Carrie Dolan. And I represent the towns of Duxbury, Faston, Moortown, Waitsfield, and Warren. And I'm from the town of Waitsfield. Representative oh. Lefebvre. It looks a little Yes, uh, good morning. Um, I live in the town of Newark, which I represent. You can't hear me or not? We can hear you. We can hear you. We when we when we hear from Paul, we give I'll him a little over. We give him space because he's got oh. a delay. Go ahead. <laughs> okay, great. Um, I represent towns in Orleans, Caledonia, and Essex. Two, one town in uh, Orleans, one town in Caledonia, and the other towns are in Northern Essex. Uh, altogether, they represent eight towns. Thank you. Repres Representative Morgan. Good morning. I represent Grand Isle County and West Milton. Representative Morris. Good morning, team. <clears throat> Christy Morris, a uh, representative from Springfield and the parts of North Springfield that Tom Bach doesn't cover. Representative Satkowitz. Good morning, I'm Larry Satkowitz and I live in Randolph and I represent also Braintree, Brookfield, Granville and Roxbury. And I will have my video up soon. I'm having some problems this morning. Thanks. And we have Representative Terenzini. Yeah, Representative Tom Terrence, Indy, Rutland Town. 
That's your House Natural Resources and Fish and Wildlife Committee. Thank you. Excellent. Um, so um, I, I hope you don't mind, uh, now that we're all here, I said this earlier, maybe before some of you came on, I tend to be informal in terms of calling on people. I don't use representative. And if you're offended by that, um, just let me know and I will say representative. But I sort of feel that we say the word representative so many times, it probably wastes a whole lot of time. And we're just real people, you know? So um, our, our witness today, our guest is uh, Carrie Jaguer, who is the policy director for the Public Health and Agricultural Resources Management Agency, um, or management in the Agency of Agriculture, Food and Markets. And so Carrie, welcome. Um, I don't, and by the way, oh, I see Harvey's coming in. Excellent. Hi, Harvey, how are you? Thank you for noticing I miss Harvey because he's our um, ranking member now and I was going down in alphabetical order. <laughs> well, no, Amy, he wasn't on. He just came in and so, um, yeah, I, I can't blame him, but no problem. No, I can uh, see everyone. Harvey, do you wanna say who you, where you represent? I represent the towns of New Haven, Weybridge and Bridport. Excellent. And John O'Brien, are you- farming a lot of the farming community down here. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Yes, we're glad you're here. Um, and John, did you introduce yourself? I think I missed you. No, you got me. Okay, good, I sorry. I don't many towns. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I like that, that, yeah, Vicki, we got somebody with eight towns here. <laughs> yeah. Hopping you. <laughs> hey, but he's a single, he's a single district, I think, Paul. One, one representative in that district. A lot of territory he covers. That's correct. Yeah. yeah. Yes. All right. Um, so, Carrie, uh, thank you for joining us and giving us a presentation. I think it was two years ago, or <clears throat> last year, the two years ago, we had a presentation to really look <clears throat> at the science of glyphosate. And uh, we appreciate you being here today. So, why don't you take it away? Thank you, uh, Carolyn. And and welcome the uh, folks from the House Natural Resources Committee. I, it's rare that I uh, get to address your committee. Um, I didn't know how you would want it to start. I don't know if I can share my screen or not, if that's something Linda can allow. Linda you can, can share. Can make you a co-host. Gary is co-host and can share. Okay, you, you may share. Yeah, and I didn't know if you wanted to sort of, sort of. I understand that um, chlorpyrifos is another topic um, that's come up a bit, and I, I don't mind um, telling the story of what's happened with chlorpyrifos regulation in the state if if folks are interested. Sure. Well, why don't we why don't we cover that as well? Because um, I believe there is a bill uh, about that, and um, I know we took some action on that a couple three years ago, um, mm -hmm. so that you cannot possess, own, buy, or anything else chlorpyrifos in the state at this point. But you can you can tell the story, Carrie. So why don't you go ahead? All right, I will. I'm now trying switching between Teams and. Um, Zoom, I haven't figured out exactly how to share my screen. Do you want to send the file to Linda and she can share it for you? She has them, but I'm... Okay, well, while you're figuring that out, um, Jim, you have your hand up. I, I do, thank you. And I'm curious, is there a um, way to allow comments? Hey. Um, from the uh, YouTube promoters uh, uh, into the meeting, um, or is there a policy not to do that? At this point, my understanding is that there is a policy not to do that. Thank you very much. Sure. I figured it out. Good. I'll, I'll start off with a with a story, if you'll allow me. Sure. Um, Can go, Amy. go ahead. Well, I'm just, I'm hearing from folks who seem they're following us on our YouTube and I'm just gonna ask Amanda if there's a way to post the live link on our webpage to the YouTube so that people who generally follow House Natural could find that um, directly. 
if, if yeah. it's not possible right now, don't do it. But if it is, that would be helpful. Thanks. Absolutely. <clears throat> okay, Gary, why don't you go ahead? Yeah, they should definitely have a direct link to this. Okay, should I should I wait until that's live or just continue? Um, well, why don't you go ahead and um, okay. I don't think it would, should take very long for Amanda to make that happen. All right. Well, for the record, uh, Carrie Jaguer, Vermont Agency of Agriculture, uh, the director of the Public Health Ag Resource Management Division. Um, we house the pesticide, feed seed, fertilizer regulatory programs, as well as the vector management, um, the mosquito programs, also nursery uh, inspection, hemp, ginseng, um, sort of most everything on the ag input side except uh, what comes out of the animal or <laughs> whether that's the milk or the or the meat or uh, <clears throat> manure those are left to other divisions in the agency <clears throat> so the epa has been reviewing chlorpyrifos and eliminating uses of all the organophosphates um, for roughly 15 years now. And in 2017, we were set to see chlorpyrifos um, go away nationally. And in that time, you know, as, as <clears throat> the media likes to do, um, we had an individual who wrote for the Free Press at the time, I believe it was Sam Hemingway, who published an article that uh, chlorpyrifos was not going away fast enough. And, you know, instead of seeing chlorpyrifos disappear through the channels of ch trade, <clears throat> we had applicators in the state uh, read that article, go out and buy as much chlorpyrifos as they could find in Vermont, go to New York and get as much as they could find, um, and all the stores in New Hampshire. So we had, um, you know, one newspaper article suggesting that Vermont should do away with this product faster, which caused it to really disappear from the store shelves. And unfortunately, in 2013, it was, um, you know, we were seeing misuses for, for bed bugs um, in Representative Terenzini's uh, territory or towns. It was in Rutland, where we had. Um, misuse of chlorpyrifos and we invited EPA to come up and help us clean those up and there were we found it at levels that would be above any acceptable health level um, in more than 20 houses and we did have EPA come and help us clean clean that up um, and in the meantime <clears throat> while we were we were aware of what was going on in and around the science um, at EPA. We're very involved with the product managers at EPA because uh, we were having such an issue with chlorpyrifos, chlorpyrifos misuse and incidental exposure from that misuse that we were working very closely with EPA at the time. And we were very, very happy that it, all the uses were going to go away. Um, the administrations changed, those uses did not go away, and uh, you all wrote us this letter. And basically, I'll, I'll read you the letter very quickly, if, if you would like, and it says, as chairs of the House Committee on Ag and Forest and Senate Agriculture Committee, we've heard many concerned Vermont legislative colleagues and from the constituents about the 2017 federal reversal on cancellation of the insecticide chlorpyrifos. Two bills have been introduced in the House and one in the Senate that require a ban on chlorpyrifos. This reversal is worrisome and does not appear to be based on science. EPA's own data indicated that chlorpyrifos poses a very real risk to human, human health and the environment and its impending cancellation get the, the meat of it is as such, we're petitioning you under the authority of 6VSA section 11103 to regulate the sale of pesticides to promote the public health, safety and welfare 
and protect agriculture and natural resources but by denying the registration of chlorpyrifos containing products. Uh, and we honored your letter. Um, many of you signed it. Um, I see Tom. Um, there are many more signatures in the house. And we honored that. We were able to deny registration of chlorpyrifos using the science, the available science that EPA produced. And we were the first state to do that. Not that Vermont needs to be first all the time, but we were the first state to do that. And as such, many other states have tried to follow suit. Um, New York had tried to eliminate chlorpyrifos um, using a legislative ban. When it got to the governor's office, that was vetoed and they were sent back and told to use the regulatory process that exists. We've used that regulatory process in Vermont. We've also visited all the class A dealers and golf courses and any place that would have stockpiled chlorpyrifos and move that through our um, disposal program. So we've, we've eliminated all the chlorpyrifos we can find. That's not saying it's complete. We still do see um, products that have been um, denied registration show up. We still see DDT and that's been out of, uh, that's been not registered since the 70s. Um, so we'll occasionally see some show up, but uh, we won't see any more come into the state to be offered for sale. Um, I've heard the argument that the agency could potentially um, revisit the registration of chlorpyrifos. Um, that's, we don't make political decisions. That was a decision based on science not likely to change. So if you're looking to ban chlorpyrifos, it will provide no additional protection to Vermont or Vermonters, but it will get a headline or two. Um, and if you're looking for a bill that um, creates headlines, I, 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 that, that uh, is potentially one to do that. And I'll pause right there before we move on to glyphosate if, if there wants to be any discussion. Uh, I see Carrie's hand up. Thank you and good morning, the other Carrie. <laughs> it's, it's good to see you and thank good you for too. coming in today. Mm -hmm. uh, my question is when you say uh, it, it occasionally shows up, can you describe a bit about what that process is and when you discover, how you discover some of these banned or not banned, but some of these listed uh, the chemicals? Yeah, so um, a portion of the pesticide registration fee, um, $5 of every pesticide that gets registered in the state, and there's about 11,000 registered pesticides annually gets diverted into our disposal fund. And we contract with the waste management districts to collect waste pesticides for us under grants. So we'll pay for the disposal of those. And with <laughs> that um, grant agreement, they, they report to us what has been collected um, during either the <coughs> standard um, hazardous waste collection or the special um, household hazardous waste collection days. So we do get reports and that's where we do see some of the old products show up, but it's very rare. When we first started our clean sweep um, program in the mid eighties, we were seeing a lot more DDT and Silvex discontinued pesticides that uh, folks would find in barns or sheds. Um, we're seeing less and that, less of those, but occasionally we will see uh, DDT still show up through the disposal program. And I presume you hear some education or outreach to uh, producers regarding the, the, the dangerous use of these chemicals? Yeah, so it's no, it's no longer really producers that would have them. It would be homeowners that, uh, it's usually when someone purchases a new home in the shed or basement is garage is not cleaned out. 
and they'll discover um, old pesticides and bring them to the um, solid waste districts to have them disposed. If it's a large, if it's a farm or something, we will show up and um, do that disposal contract that disposal ourselves. Thank you. All right, Jim, Jim McCullough's hand is up. Yes, um, I want to point out to Carrie that the um, banning process in order to even be doable must be done prior to an economic expectation by the people that are affected by the ban. Hydraulic fracturing is that example here in Vermont. We weren't hydraulic fracturing, but, and therefore we did not with the ban um, take away anybody's economic expectations. So with that, a ban um, makes opportunity makes sense, not to mention the fact that yes, things can change and do over time. I want actually more importantly in the moment to educate you just a little bit that professional decorum does not permit um, ascribing motives to people. And I take personal umbrance that you're telling me and others, we are headline seekers. And I will, of course, accept an apology. Uh, Representative McCulloch, would you like that apology now or at the end of the presentation? At your convenience, sir. <laughs> Very good. Well, I do apologize, Representative McCulloch. Um, <clears throat> I still assert that uh, there would be no additional protections to Vermonters um, or the environment were we to assert a ban. Accepted. All right, any other questions? Uh, and I also wanna take just a moment to, to uh, say that it was actually Representative Ben Joseph uh, one of Leland's predecessors who um, really got the ball rolling on this uh, registration. The, the petition that you saw scroll by, which was signed by many of us, um, was, was really initiated by Ben. And, uh, and even though the, you know, it had already started and we weren't using chlorpyrifos in the state other than for rare, um, rare occasions, uh, and under highly, highly uh, prescribed uh, practices and uses, he really got he really got it going. Uh, I see Terry's hand is up. Let, let's just call on Terry, and then we'll move on to uh, glyphosate. Terry. Yeah, uh, I was just wondering from Kerry whether, uh, at least from past testimony, it seems like uh, if you ban something, you're required to have a replacement for it. I was just wondering if that was still the case and what kind of a replacement would be for um, this drug. Yep, understood, uh, Harry. And, and the organophosphate class of insecticides has largely been replaced by the synthetic pyrethroid class of insecticides, as well as the neonicotinoids. Um, the largest sort of use of chlorpyrifos in the state prior to the advent of the pre-treated seeds coming into the state was for furrow um, that it would go in the corn furrow before the seed was planted. And we used to see uh, tens of thousands of pounds of chlorpyrifos being used going in those seed furrows before the seeds would come into the state as treated seeds. So to, to um, fully answer your question though, and to make the rest of the committees aware, um, not only do we regulate the use of pesticides, but we also are charged with 
from providing tools um, through special registrations, through emergency exemptions, and the largest sort of use pattern that we're dealing with right now currently is there are very few products that are actually federally registered for use in beehives. So we've gone through a bunch of special registration processes to make certain pesticides available to beekeepers for use in hives. So we also, we are tasked with providing tools for applicators when those tools don't exist. Um, the latest Section 18 or emergency exemption that we were working on is a product to eliminate COVID from the air. So this is a product that does kill the virus in the air. We're working with EPA to get a special registration for the use of that product. All right, thanks, Carrie. Um, do you wanna move on to glyphosate? We have about uh, just a little more than a half an hour left. Yeah, and this is um, a presentation I think most folks have seen before. If not, um, feel and also feel free to stop me at any given point. Um, I know, by the way, this the uh, Carrie's materials are on our website and um, or on our web page, and I'm hoping that they're on Natural Resources page as well. So you've seen this or a version of this presented last year by Erica Cummings. Um, she prepared the slides as well as the fact sheet, and um, we'll go through that data as well. Um, and I'll start with the presentation, and it is an adaptation of a presentation that was presented um, by the main state toxicologist. All right. Can everybody see that? I can. All right, we'll start there. Um, glyphosate and AMPA. AMPA is the first breakdown product of glyphosate. And I'll talk more about that shortly. So what is glyphosate? Glyphosate is a non-selective herbicide. It's, it kills both grasses and broadleaf plants. Sort of when we talk about corn herbicides, the corn herbicides are selective. They only kill uh, broadleaf plants. Uh, corn is a grass. It allows um, grasses to grow. Uh, the, the herbicides that get used on lawns for lawn care are also selective and they only control broadleaf plants. Um, glyphosate was first registered in 1974. It is the most widely, pesticide, widely used pesticide in the world. And in Vermont, we have over 750 products containing glyphosate that are registered. And they vary from ag uses to um, aquatic uses to right away uses. They're, these are all different uses specified on the label as well as homeowner products. Uh, glyphosate is the most widely available um, product available to homeowners as an herbicide as well. Um, oh, I got ahead of myself. And it is one of the most widely used and widely permitted uh, herbicides in the state. Um, how does it work? Glyphosate prevents plants from making certain proteins that are needed for plant growth. Um, they stop a specific enzy enzyme pathway. The shift I can't say it. I can pronounce all the herbicide names for you, but I'll uh, let a botanist uh, um, pronounce that for me. The schizemic acid pathway is only found in plants, fungi, algae, bacteria, and some other microorganisms. Glyphosate must be applied actively to actively growing plants in order to work. Um, glyphosate binds tightly to the soil. It can persist in the soil for up to six months, depending on soil type, it's broken down by soil bacteria, unlikely to get in the groundwater because it binds so tightly to soil. And pure glyphosate is low toxicity to fish and wildlife. That's why it's a, got an aqua, aquatically labeled product 
uh, but some products contain glyphosate may be toxic because of other ingredients in them. And when we're talking about the uh, Roundup product that has an, uh, an adjuvant in it um, that is more toxic than the ad active ingredient, and that's the POEA um, adjuvant, which we don't find in the aquatically uh, labeled glyphosate formulations. How is glyphosate evaluated for safety? Um, the EPA evaluates and registers all pesticides. We can, I can talk for an hour just on the registration process if necessary. Um, scientific process to evaluate risk in human health um, and a toxicity test. Um, the measure of toxicity is the LD50. It's not the best necessary, necessarily way to talk about how pesticides are, are toxic, but it is, it is a tool for ranking them. And the LD50 is amount of dose of the chemical, which produces deaths of 50% of a population of test animals um, administered by a variety of methods, uh, usually oral or dermal. Um, Inhalation is also sometimes uh, used. I mean, it's normally ex expressed as milligrams of substance per kilogram of an animal's body weight. Um, when you're talking about toxicity, less is more. So the lower the number, the more toxic it is, uh, the less you need to cause a toxic effect. Here's um, no pesticide is safe. Gly Glyphosate can be used safely if the label is followed. Um, glyphosate falls in the low risk category and it's relatively non-toxic to humans. And this is sort of the table that I showed the committee before. And it has, you know, from, from the least top toxic substances on the top down to the most toxic on the bottom. And the categories that they fall in, these are, um, well sort of established categories that um, compounds fall in. And you'll all have this to, to look at um, on your own. And you know, this is sort of when, when you hear folks say that uh, glyphosate is less toxic than table salt. They're using these LD50 numbers, um, but that's sort of using LD50 as a relative comparison is, <clears throat> it sort of deminimizes the risk and, and not necessarily in some cases. So glyphosate in food, glyphosate is used on a variety of food crops and trace amounts have been found in many products. Um, here's what we know about glyphosate. Here's a list of, um, these are basically tolerances that are listed in the federal register. And these are in parts per million. And it's based on a reference dose of one milligram per kilogram per day. Um, so Carrie, could I just interrupt you? Could you go back to that slide? Could you some way, uh, enlarge it slightly it's almost micro i i am not i'm working on a lob tap and i can't expand it yeah but. um i don't know if i i'm carolyn you'll have the uh sort of okay I, no I can't, but basically what it's saying is animal feed has got a 400 part per million tolerance established in the cfr um and carrots have a five Okay. Most of the tolerances fall around 0.2 um, parts per million. And generally we talk in parts per billion or trillion when we're talking about uh, environmental samples. When I talk about the sort of the surface water data, we'll, we'll have that discussion again. But Linda's telling me the slide shows on the uh, webpage. So uh, if you all wanted, I, I'm going to it right now. So, yep. Thank you, Carrie. Yeah, and basically, based on that reference dose, all I'm getting at is a 143-pound person can consume um, 65 milligrams 
of glyphosate per day and expect no long-term or short-term effects, including cancer risk. Okay. And I think uh, I saw a little flash that uh, represents- uh, Carrie, Carrie has her hand up. Yeah, go ahead. Yes, and perhaps we can revisit this. I know we're short of time, but interested to know about that reference dose. Um, in the past, EPA has been criticized because they haven't uh, targeted the reference dose to sensitive members of the population. So uh, my question it would be, uh, what would those reference doses look like if we had tried to do that? So we do do that now. So that was part of the Food Quality Protection Act that was passed in 93. Every pesticide needed to be reevaluated in 15 years. Glyphosate has gone through that process and their RFD went up and they, they did look at children zero to six months as the most sensitive population. So in the past, the reference dose was not based on um, the most sensitive population, but all of those um, reference doses now are because it's been 15 years since since 1993. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, and then uh, the, um, the bit about cancer and what's been going on um, with regard to is, is glyphosate uh, considered to cause cancer. And so that came out from the, in 2015, it, the International Agency for Cancer Research, or IARC, placed glyphosate in their group 2A category. Um, the IARC is, is not the World Health Organization. Um, IARC is a subset. It, it's an independent agency that makes these classifications. Um, and it doesn't look at risk. And it, doesn't, it picks and chooses which studies the IARC will use. And so on the right here, so the European Food Safety Authority, European Chemical Agency, US EPA, um, Health Canada, Australia, Japan, New Zealand, the World Health Organization have all not changed the classification of glyphosate to that 2A category. So only one of these agencies has stated um, that has up the uh, cancer classification for glyphosate. And here's a sort of um, smattering, if you will, of the, of the tests used to determine by the, all the other countries, not the IR, um, of whether or not glyphosate does in fact cause cancer. And um, studies on the left suggest that it prevents cancer or decreases cancer. The studies on the right say it increases cancer. So it's not a yes or no um, for one particular study, but if you do look at the weight of evidence here for non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, the, uh, the verdict is still considered out by most agencies. Um, and everything either causes or prevents cancer. And here's a slide of cancer studies of various different uh, foods that we consume that either protect against cancer or cause cancer. And you can see, um, you know, we hear the news back and forth about wine, wine being great for your health or wine being not great for your health. The same is true of eggs, um, beef, and many other um, foods that we consume. So everything, so if you can have studies that suggest both and the weight of evidence is usually what makes that determination. And why we talk about risk, IARC not incorporating risk is because they don't really have to. They're looking at studies, but not exposure. And uh, this slide has sort of been put together to illustrate that. It's the banana, can, banana peel in the vehicle. Both can cause accidents, both can pose a hazard. Autom automobile is riskier because you're must, much more likely to be in an automobile crash than in a banana peel accident. 
banana peels pose less risk. And that's sort of the story that we're talking about when we talk about pesticides and label restrictions and personal protective equipment. Um, nobody says pesticides are safe, but they can in fact be used safely. Um, this is in your package. And what I also included is the list of what these other red dots are. So I did send to Linda Lehman for your folks to look at because it's interesting um, to me, everything in, in this 1A, 2A and 2B category, um, I've, there's a PDF of all of these, uh, they're, they're either chemicals or, or activities. Um, you know, working the night shift is probably a carcinogen. Eating red meat is probably a carcinogen. Eating processed meat has definitely been determined to be a carcinogen. Um, being a, working in a barber shop or, or a beauty salon is considered carcinogenic, a carcinogenic activity. And there's a lot of other chemicals in there, the ones we know about, um, nicotine, alcohol, they're, they're on that list and it's interesting. And I just thought uh, it would be good for folks to have and look at. We can go through it if we have time. Um, and this is the sort of that has caused all the uh, um, debate, if you will. So basically the a $289 million lawsuit was awarded to a groundskeeper that was terminally Ill, terminally Ill with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. He was doused several, several times, plus sprayed in the face regularly, um, developed cancer 18 months to two years after starting the position. Um, that was a decision that was made by a jury and I would have probably sided with the defendant myself, but in this case, uh, court cases don't change the science and the agricultural health study uh, still does not support a cause and effect relationship between exposure of glyphosate and non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Um, and this is a link to the to last year's interim decision to re-register glyphosate. EPA can still, still considers it not likely to be a carcinogenic to human, um, according to the label to prevent, <coughs> oh, sorry here, um, label changes, just that the label changes that were proposed are further spray drift management, um, herbicide resistance, non-target organism advisory statement and label consistency measures. Those were the changes that were made to the label. Um, and this is one that I will let you all look at for yourself because I'd like to sort of entertain some questions. Um, this is the one that we see posted on the internet. Um, all the time, mix a half gallon of vinegar, a cup of salt and some dish soap. And this is just using that LD50 again and the comparative toxicities of using that versus using glyphosate. And Uh, while you're while you're calling that up, Carrie has her hand up. Go ahead, Carrie. Yeah. Thank you, and uh, and I really appreciate this as the beginning of an important conversation. And we know that state government is about protecting public health and safety, and we're constantly looking at the question of risk. And although I think it's helpful to to uh, put that in context. It's also, I think, important to acknowledge that the actions we take as government in the legislature with, in partnership with, um, I think, with, with uh, folks across the state is to how to reduce that risk. And uh, although you, you raise, I think, somewhat in, 
ingest the, the risks associated with eating meat, you know, there's a whole suite of questions that could come up from just that question, which isn't really helpful when we try to think about how to reduce the risks that are posed to uh, by the use of harmful chemicals. So I, I only want to flag that in this in this presentation uh, because it, it's a serious topic and something that we really need to be focusing on about uh, working on reducing that risk of exposure. The other thing I, I, I wrestle with, uh, just as a commentary, is that you know when the burden is placed on EPA and not the chemical industry in, in uh, determining the toxicity and the uh, risks to the public, it puts quite a bit of a uh, burden on public resources. And uh, and typically EPA is has their arms tied. You know they. We know about PFAS, for example, and it's taken, it's been on the market since the 1950s and we're only now, we only regulate five out of, out of the 8,000 that have been produced for the marketplace. So I, I just wanna flag that as a, a challenge for us uh, because we, we are trying to, to address public health and safety here, buying down that risk and, and how do we address it, particularly associated with the use of, of chemicals in, our, in, in the, um, marketplace. That's a great segue. Thank you um, for the setup. Um, and yes, I agree. So the, the list of um, probable and possible carcinogens is somewhat in just be and partly because I don't, I don't know what a lot of the chemicals on that list are. And I, I would implore you to go ahead and check it out for yourself. Um, and look at those reg uh, relative rankings of different products. And that said, in evaluating risk, um, two things. Um, over the years, the Office of Pesticide Programs through PREA, which is the Pesticide Registration Improvement Act, um, is Office of Pesticide Program is a lot has a lot more funding than any of the other programs, whether it be TOSCA, the Clean Water Act, or RICRA. Um, so those resources are, there's a pathway to get them to EPA through, the, through PREA, and PREA has been reauthorized by Congress up, um, for four consecutive um, times and I can talk further about the Pesticide Registration Improvement Act, but I just also wanted to point out you're tying it back to risk. And when our pro we have a very robust um, pesticide monitoring program in the state. And with the adoption of GMO technology and well and cover cropping, we did see more glyphosate use um, get reported in the state. So we began to monitor for glyphosate and AMPA, its breakdown product in 2006. Um, so this is the list of samples we've taken and analyzed for glyphosate in both surface and groundwater um, from 2006 to 2020. Um, we've, as of um, earlier this last month, about a month ago, uh, January 5th, our, this um, spreadsheet was updated. And in that time, we've taken 784 samples, both surface and groundwater, that we've analyzed for both AMPA and glyphosate. And our detection level for them is um, 10 parts per billion. So you'll see the levels that you can eat are in the part per million range. Um, the levels that are that have no impact in the environment. Um, drinking a drinking water level for glyphosate would be 700 parts per million. Um, we're looking down at 10 parts per billion. So in order of magnitude lower, um, I do believe there is a proposed study from USGS and they're proposing to go down even lower than, uh, than our detection limit, but uh, at a level of 10 parts per billion, we, we don't see glyphosate in surface or groundwater or its primary breakdown product, uh, AMPA. 
So this that's the conversation about risk. Um, we currently don't see it um, leave where it's used in Vermont. And I wanted to leave some time for a conversation about, you know, glyphosate use and why we're seeing more. And that's basically because of the adoption of uh, conservation practices um, to keep phosphorus out of the lake. I think we're up to about 40,000 acres of our corn ground. We plant nearly 100,000 acres of corn and about 40,000 acres are now in either conservation tillage practices, uh, either using cover crops, no-till or low-till practices, which have uh, done a tremendous job of keeping phosphorus out of the lake. Um, that said, those practices do require the use of glyphosate. And I'm probably going to stop sharing my screen now. And this is the this is the uh, the American Cancer Society, and it lists the things that are known carcinogens. Um, aflatoxins is something we look for in grain samples fairly regularly. Um, these are all the known carcinogens. And it has the uh, it has all all uh, three of the top categories. The products that are unclassified are not on this list. All right. Thank you, Carrie. Um, I'm wondering. A Amy has her hand up. Go ahead, Amy. Um, thank you. And um, <clears throat> I guess I'd just say, we, since the conversation started out with. Comments on headlines in the last 24 hours, there's been an announcement that Bayer has a settlement fund set up for addressing cancer and its uh, and glyphosate's relationship to it. So that's uh, just a, a note for the group. Um, but I also just, our committee has been spending a fair amount of time assessing and understanding the current state of our environment. and. We've um, recently learned about widespread and dramatic declines in all, all insects. Um, and that's starting to have a noticeable impact on birds. And I guess um, I, I would like you to comment on, remind me, because I, I haven't, I don't remember. I know we've done something with neonicotinoids, but the relationship between glyphosate use and neonicotinoids, and I'm wondering if you're monitoring for neonicotinoids and um, if you could just remind me of where we're at with that and comment. Thank you. Yep. Yep. Um, boy, to tie glyphosate use and neonicotinoid use, I guess, would be tying them back to the sort of conservation tillage practices. And I don't have... Um, personal confirmation, I, you should probably talk to some of the extension folks, but the argument that I have heard is the no-till, low-till uh, conservation tillage practices create more of a harborage for the insects that um, they're trying to control with the neonicotinoid seed treatments. Um, but in the, in, the neo, in the pollinator protection bill that passed, um, two sessions ago, we did make all neonicotinoid products restricted use. So we took the neonicotinoid products out of the hands of the homeowners. So you need to be a certified applicator in order to use neonics. We also created the authority in the agency to create uh, best management practices around the use of neonicotinoid seed treatments. So there is authority to regulate treated articles. And in that time, we have been monitoring um, to see if these products <laughs> And I can share with you the results of all of our monitoring for, for Neonix, but uh, that's really outside. I, I don't think I can do it in six minutes. That's a, a spreadsheet, a statewide spreadsheet we can look at. And we do work with uh, DEC when they collect their um, stormwater samples 
I don't know if you've ever had testimony from Pete Stangle, but he runs a program that when it, after it rains, he goes out and samples lakes uh, and tributaries to Lake Champlain. To, and while he's out um, doing those assessments, he's collecting samples to, for our lab to monitor for uh, pesticides to see what's run, coming off the landscape during rain events. And 99% um, of the state looks really good. Where we do see trouble is, well, um, Jewett Brook. Jewett Brook is an already impaired watershed. And um, there's been a tremendous amount of money spent as of in the last few years to sort of improve agronomic practices up there, but that uh, watershed still is impacted or, or impaired. Um, and that is an area where of concern for us. Sorry, did I answer your question? I rambled a bit. Yeah, um, you, you got to some of it. I guess I'm wondering what the status of the BMPs is then for the neonics. Mm -hmm. um, we have, I've got uh, an employee who's working with folks at UVM Extension to draft those BMPs. Um, they're in draft form. I can share with your committee what we have so far. And what is the timeline timeline for getting them out? I can um, share that in an email. Amy, um, I'll have someone from my staff follow up with you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, great, thanks, Carrie. Uh, John has his hand up, John O'Brien. Go ahead, John. Thank you, Carolyn. Carrie, I had a, a question. I guess it's, is glyphosate the, the Coca-Cola of, of herbicides and in, in that is it proprietary to Monsanto Bear um, or or is it the sort of thing where that compound you know there are generic knockoffs that are used in other parts of the world or are the are the sort of activity in the tort world now um, is that seen as an opportunity for other big chemical companies to come up with the next the next thing to replace glyphosate. Um, everybody is always looking for the next thing, um, lower toxicity, more effective. But uh, glyphosate is off patent. Other producers can manufacture it. And we do see um, Bear Monsanto still makes the Roundup. Um, but we do see other products. Uh, that are that contain glyphosate that are not um, bare Monsanto products. Every chemical manufacturer now pretty much has a glyphosate product. Uh, thanks, Carrie. Thanks, John. Um, we have about two minutes left. I'm wondering if there are any last questions. Maybe we could take one if uh, someone had one. All right, Jim, go ahead. So then I'm not, sh I don't know if Terry, uh, Kerry can answer this in two minutes, but perhaps he would do it in an email to the two committees. Could you, um, uh, Kerry, talk about GBHs and the, the effects of, of mixtures with glyphosate and, and um, the inherent dangers or increased actual uh, harm that glyphosate is it able to do with these GBHs? In GBHs, you're talking about glyphosate-based herbicides? Indeed, I am, yep. Okay, and um, we're talking about adjuvants or or you're talking about tank mixes with other herbicides. So the, the first, go ahead. Yeah, uh, I'm not that deep into the science, only to know that um, often mixtures actually change the character of the the individual parts. You could respond yeah. to both perhaps in your email. Yeah, all right, very good, very good. Um, all I can say, uh, Representative McCullough, is when, when um, our right-of-way applicators, whether that's the guardrail applicators or the train, the folks that uh, treat the train tracks come in with a permit, they do want to cover more modes of action. Glyphosate covers one mode of action, if you will. Um, 
and the applicators like like to use or have in a tank mix a bunch of products that cover multiple modes of action so they don't get herbicide resistant. And I can discuss that, but I think you're also talking about the synergistic effects of the adjuvants, um, whether they're oils or waxes or, or surfactants. That's that correct. It. Okay, I'll address that. Thank you. All right, and, and Carrie's hand is up and it's 10 o'clock, but let Carrie, you go ahead and we'll just get this in and then I'll give instructions to the committees as to what they're supposed to do for the next section of you know, our meetings. Thank you, I'll just be, be very brief. And if Carrie could get back to us, that would be great. Interested to know when you mentioned that it appears that some of the potential contamination or runoff containing pesticides is coming from uh, homeowner use. Uh, very interested to know whether there's appropriate labeling so homeowners are aware of the particular chemicals of concern and the dangers associated with that. In particular, as what uh, Chair Sheldon had mentioned, the impacts to our, um, our insect and, um, and uh, the wildlife and biodiversity of the state. Mm. So, um... I, I'm, I guess I don't un, completely understand the question. And um, what I was saying is in that pollinator protection bill that passed two sessions ago, um, we did require, it did require all neonicotinoid insecticides to be labeled as restricted use. Which, and if a product is restricted use in the state, you have to be a certified applicator through our agency in order to be able to purchase that product. So we have eliminated homeowners' ability to use neonicotinoid insecticides. That said, there was a, a study um, in California, probably almost eight years ago now, that was finding homeowner uses of synthetic pyrethroids, in particular by Fenthrin, ending up in sediments of small streams. So the risk mitigation efforts that took place is um, there were many different um, new label restrictions that said where and when those products could be used and uh, sort of it modified the use in such a way that exterior building applications were no longer allowed. Um, and that sort of mitigated the risk to benthic macroinvertebrates that we were seeing from synthetic pyrethroids. And that's an, a, another story um, we had asked our, we were finding um, the bifenthrin or synthetic pyrethroids in sediments um, down in Manchester in the Batten Kill. And we had asked some of the tree homeowner sort of ornamental tree folks to stop using those products. And uh, essentially they all switch to the neonics. Um, so we do see a spike in our neonicotinoid use in our, at around 2011, when we asked them to stop using those products. So, you know, you always gotta be careful what, what you do when you're changing up the toolbox. Well, thanks, we've, we've run out of time essentially. I'll take this moment to thank Carrie and to also say as a public service announcement that we did, uh, we did pass a bill that bans the use of neonicotinoid products uh, for household use in the state of Vermont. I'm aware as I, re I represent a district that um, uh, is next to New Hampshire that they can come in, uh, but we don't want them being used here in the state for household use. So want that to be really clear for folks who might be watching um, this uh, YouTube. And so uh, Carrie, uh, thank you so much. Um, what I'm, I'm gonna read Linda's chat to me, which says we're going to leave YouTube for the break so that the nine to 10 meeting is just the subject and House Natural Resources can put it on their webpage. We'll go back onto YouTube at 10 15 with the same meeting, people won't have to sign in again. And I'm assuming that's just for house agriculture and forestry. That's uh, correct. Okay. 
So Amy, I noticed you unmuted yourself. Would you like to say something? Yes, I just wanted to say thank you, Carolyn, for bringing us together on this and um, let House Natural Resources know we're, we're on for 1030 in, in our own committee room. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Amy, thank you so much for, uh, for coming on today. Really appreciate it. Yeah, me too. Thanks. All right. Okay, everybody. So uh, House Ag, thank you guys. Uh, House Ag, stick with this. We'll take a break. Uh, shut off your um, your video and your and please mute.